Hello, I'm Marissa, Chief Entomologist at the Butterfly Biosphere here at Thanksgiving Point. Recently, there's been a lot of attention around the Asian giant hornets, sometimes called the murder hornets, and their discovery here in North America. And so there's a lot of fear um, and questions and concerns around you know, safety of humans and also what their impact might be for agriculture and our ecosystems. So let's talk about them a little bit today. The Asian giant hornet is the largest hornet in the world, averaging about two inches long, and they have a very characteristic yellow face. Like other hornets, they nest underground, and this particular species can be found at lower elevations and is ranging from temperate to tropical types of climates. So at least for us here in Utah, there's, uh, they're very unlikely to actually establish here with us. They do have pretty powerful venom. It's stronger than that of honeybees, can cause a lot of pain, uh, but it would take about 10 stings for the average adult human to need to visit the hospital, and at least twice that for it to you know, be anywhere near fatal. Um, most of the deaths that are being reported by these hornets in Asian countries are usually uh, from people that uh, have an allergy to the venom. So in general, these aren't any more dangerous than the bees and wasps that we have here already, uh, unless you are allergic to the venom. Our agricultural system relies very heavily on honeybees to pollinate uh, many different crops across the country. And uh, honeybee keepers already have a lot of different health threats to contend with. Things like parasitic varroa mites, like loss of habitat and the flowering plants that come with that, uh, and also the widespread use of pesticides. So they don't wanna have this hornet to contend with either. Um, like other hornets, the Asian giant hornet is a carnivore, so they hunt other insects. What's really impressive and unique about them is one of their hunting techniques that they use in late summer. So this is the time when their populations are at peak numbers, they have a lot of workers that they can send out, and they will launch these massive attacks on other social insects. So other hornets, paper wasps, yellow jackets, honeybees. And so they'll show up and they'll very quickly kill every adult, as quick as they can. And that's called the slaughter phase. And then they'll take over this hive and they'll guard it for the next couple of days or a couple of weeks, however long it takes for them to harvest all the larvae and pupae that they will take home and feed to their sisters. So that is what is particularly scary about these hornets for our honeybee keepers. Now, uh, the Japanese honeybees, have co-evolved with this predator, and so they have their own unique defense that they can use sometimes. So um, when there's an intruder hornet, these honeybees can clump around it, and by buzzing and vibrating their wings and their body, they can collectively raise their body temperature and the temperature of that wasp until it gets so high that it dies. Uh, that's pretty cool. Unfortunately, we utilize the European honeybee in our agriculture here in North America, so they don't have that same defense that they can use against these hornets. So why are we hearing about these hornets right now? There haven't even been any confirmed sightings at all this year. Where this story began is last August, 2019, um, a hive was discovered in British Columbia and it was eradicated in September. And separately from that, there were also sightings of a honeybee hive being attacked by hornets in Washington state, in addition to one individual being collected and identified. So, like our native bees and wasps and hornets, um, these hornet colonies will die out at the end of fall and the only individuals that overwinter are the queens. They've mated in the fall and they're gonna hide in a burrow underground or in some wood. And then in the spring, when it warms up, that's when they start to come out. So as they begin to establish a new colony, they have to do all the work while their babies are still little larvae. And so this is the, the time when we're most likely to spot them, late spring, early summer, to find these queens, track them back to their potential nest sites, and also not have to contend with a large colony while we're trying to eradicate them. So um, agencies in these areas that are affected are starting to enlist the public and the beekeepers in those areas to keep an eye out for these wasps. Um, and that's why we're starting to hear about it more now. Unfortunately, what I'm starting to hear a little bit about is a rise of people killing other yellow and black stripey things that um, you know they're thinking might be this Asian giant hornet. So um, please let's not increase the use of pesticides and indiscriminate killing of insects just because of these sensationalized reports. 
you know, bees are really important to the health of ecosystems as pollinators and wasps and yellow jackets and hornets, they're really important as carnivores. You know, they hunt other insects and they keep those populations at balanced levels, you know, to keep a healthy, balanced ecosystem. And there's already a lot of fear and misinformation around these wasp type insects. You know, we have this idea that they're mean and they just like to sting people for no reason. But um, having, you know, headlines and, and calling these animals murder hornets, you know, just kind of feeds into that fear and misconception and isn't really helpful for, you know, understanding the role that these animals play in their environments. Yes, we don't want to have paper wasps living in a doorway that we walk through every day. You know, uh, our proximity and our sudden appearance is going to be very threatening to them and it raises our risk of getting stung. But if you can, you know, let them establish further out in your backyard, away from the house at a safe distance, they're actually very beneficial, especially if you have a garden. You know, they're going to come in and they're going to pick off all the little caterpillars and other pests in your garden. So they can be really helpful um, if we have them at a safe distance. I totally get that. So just like bees, most wasps are not social, meaning they don't live with other individuals. So all of these solitary mamas are going out and they're digging holes in the dirt or they're finding hollow stems, they're building little mud houses on the side of your house. And those are all nurseries. It's a little one room nursery. They lay an egg inside of there and then they go out and they collect a bunch of bugs to feed to that egg. And they're paralyzed, they're brought back, they're alive, so they're fresh. Um, and so that little egg can hatch, eat all that food and become a wasp. So that's what all those wasps are doing. And they're very beautiful, have elegant bodies, you know, long, thin waists. They have long legs, really shiny wings. So they're very fascinating with, you get to catch them in this process and watch the behavior of digging something out and going out and returning, coming back and forth. Even cooler than that, a lot of wasps are parasitoids, which means that they lay their eggs inside of a living host. So their body is inside of this live insect. A lot of times it's a caterpillar or soft body something. Uh, and they eat and develop and grow up inside of this insect and eventually kill it. Uh, it's kind of like out of the movie Aliens. <laughs> You can commonly see this in tomato hornworms. So those are those big, chunky green caterpillars that are threatening your tomato plants. And sometimes you might see these little white cocoons sticking out of the back of a caterpillar, and those are wasps. So um, they've eaten that caterpillar from the inside out. It's not gonna be able to become a moth and reproduce and create other pesty caterpillars. Uh, a lot of these parasitic wasps are actually very tiny. I have a little vial of them with me. We'll get a closer look at them. Uh, and they will target things like aphids and flies that are pests of crops. And so very often parasitic wasps are used as biological control in agriculture. So we can use natural predators instead of relying on pesticides. Um, these wasps that I'm holding right here actually came out of a chrysalis in our emergence chamber. So this is, you know, why we have such a special place for those uh, butterflies to emerge is because occasionally they'll come with parasites and we don't want them to escape uh, and, and threaten our native butterflies here in Utah. So we, we follow those guidelines set by the USDA to keep our ecosystem safe. But in addition to these tiny parasitoid wasps, we also have some really, some pretty big ones with really long ovipositors. Um, and so that ovipositor is actually what we think of as the stinger. So for all of Hymenoptera, that's the bees, the wasps, the ants, the stingers is a modified ovipositor. And so that's an egg laying organ. Um, and so these wasps with a really long ovipositor, they've got super sensitive antenna and so they can feel the subtle movements of like beetle larvae and other little bugs that are living inside of trees. And they can feel those movements and locate where they are exactly and stick that ovipositor through the wood right into that larva that's in there. It's just incredibly precise, very impressive. Um, so definitely don't be afraid of those because they're not out for humans. So as always, I encourage you to get outside, look closer and really get familiar with the wildlife especially the invertebrate wildlife that's in your backyard and in your native area. Um, you know, the more familiar you become with your native animals and plants, the more likely you are to be able to spot organisms that don't belong there, that aren't behaving properly, um, like the Asian giant hornets. And so then you can give a heads up to your local agricultural department um, and those agencies can come up with a plan to handle that situation and keep our ecosystems safe. 
You know, in addition to that, when you use apps like iNaturalist and you take pictures of your wildlife and where you saw it and what time of year it was spotted, that's really valuable data that researchers use. And so when they spot an animal that's in an area where it hasn't been previously seen before, that can give them a heads up that something's not right or an ecosystem's not quite healthy anymore. Thanks for joining us today to learn about hornets and wasps. I hope you can see them in a different light and that you notice them more often in your day-to-day -day activities. Uh, I'm happy to announce that the Butterfly Biosphere is reopening on Friday, May 15th, so I hope you'll come down and visit us and get to learn some more about some of our other misunderstood bugs, and hopefully you can see them in a different light too. Thank you.